Left-wing anarchist has been found guilty of preparing acts of terrorism by compiling and sharing a bomb-making manual after declaring he wanted to kill at least 50 politicians. Jacob Graham wrote a document called My Plan, in which he said he wanted to kill at least 50 people by attacking government buildings and politicians' houses. This comes in the week that saw volatile scenes outside Parliament on Wednesday night, and now the news today that three female MPs have been given taxpayer-funded bodyguards. So what has created this climate of intimidation and how do we tackle it? Well, I'm going to be joined now by former Metropolitan Police Detective Peter Blexley. Peter, give us your thoughts because it feels a bit mad to me out there. It really is. I think we're living in very troubled, mm. difficult and worrying times. There are a huge number of people that are quite rightly worried about an influx of asylum seekers, illegal immigrants, people being parachuted into their towns and their villages who don't look like us, who don't have an, any, any experience of our culture, who might find it challenging to uh, assimilate with, with others, and, of course, a number of whom, and this is an undeniable fact, have been, in recent times, convicted of very serious crimes, mm -hmm. from the most serious, like murder, to other kinds of crimes. Mm -hmm. And there is a feeling uh, amongst many, many people that if they stand up and say a statement of fact, which with facts which could read like this, I am deeply concerned about a number of single brown-faced men being parachuted into my town, village, hamlet, and the fact that they are having difficulty integrating, they're not working, they loiter on street corners, and I'm deeply worried about this. There are going to be some people from left of centre, Wokarati Central, who are going to point fingers at people mm -hmm. and accuse them of being racist. When I think somebody who expresses a concern like that, without a hint of racism in it, but a whole heap of concern about their local neighbourhood, is not being racist whatsoever mm -hmm. and should be free to say what they want express such concerns and moreover we should have a government that should listen to them mm -hmm. so so let, let, let's talk about how this stuff gets so polarized then because you're right people are quick to to point the finger and make all kinds of accusations do you think social media has played into this and these real sort of simplistic messages that every, every issue becomes black and white when actually there's a lot more gray in there for most things yeah social media plays a huge part mm -hmm. in the spreading of information disinformation hatred joy whatever you want to look at mm -hmm. it i think i think it's a tool for for good and bad probably in equal measure and of course with social media the algorithms mm -hmm. can create an echo chamber for Completely. you if you're going on and you're liking particular stuff you will invariably end up seeing more of that mm -hmm. kind of stuff and so it can just get into your head and suddenly the view that you hold you think the whole world holds that view yeah. when in fact of course it might not but it's a world that the algorithms are creating for you so it's hugely played a part and of course the internet if we look at jacob graham mm -hmm. that man convicted this week only 20 years old yeah. so radicalized at a very tender age a bit like shamima begum mm -hmm. was radicalized at a tender age and clearly wanted to carry out acts of harm on our elected MPs. Mm -hmm. Hats off to the often criticised uh, security services and police in this case for securing a conviction mm -hmm. and probably saving or stopping bloodshed. So credit where it's due. It'll be very interesting to see what sort of sentence he gets. Mm. And this is a man from a, a young man from Norris Green, known locally as the Nogger. I've been to Norris Green a number <laughs> of times, had my hair cut there and met many fabulous people there in Liverpool. Not perhaps an area you would suspect of being a hotbed for radicalising young people, but just goes to show this could happen anywhere. Yeah, well, the internet's so global, isn't it? And as you say, with those algorithms, I mean, mine just showed me Taylor Swift, so I think for me I'm pretty safe for now, but you see it, you, you like one post and suddenly your entire timeline is filled with similar things and that echo chamber point is so valid. Yes, it, it really is, and it's very dangerous. And I would suggest to people that sometimes there's quite a bit of mileage in seeking out alternative yes. views and liking some of those so that you do at least get to see those alternative views mm -hmm. and they can help shape your thinking. It might make you even more entrenched in what you think is absolutely right or it might make you say to yourself, OK, is there an element 
in an alternative argument that I might be able to agree with. I, I like conciliation more than confrontation. Yeah. So I want to talk about the, the sort of protests that we've been seeing out, outside Parliament, a, a, across London and elsewhere, um, certainly a lot outside MPs' offices. I mean, from your kind of former policing experience, this must be a really tough one for the police to tackle. But, but how do they do that? How should they do that? Well, unfortunately, with regards to London, the whole of the metropolis, which has covered so many of these demonstrations, mm -hmm. I think the Metropolitan Police, under the leadership of Sir Mark Rowley, have got themselves in a dreadful tangle. They've taken it upon themselves to do more interpreting of the law than enforcing of the law. Mm. Of course, they will have legal advisers as such. But the whole thing about the law is that it's a moving, evolving, ever-changing thing. We have what is known as judicial precedent and I know that's been eroded somewhat in recent years mm -hmm. because there are so many now very specific offences on the statute book. And, of course, the Home Secretary, James Cleverly, only a couple of weeks ago said that they're going to introduce more laws to cover um, face coverings, pyrotechnics, so fireworks and flares, yep. climbing on monuments and obstructing the roads. Mm -hmm. And I think that could be very relevant in the next few weeks because I hear rumblings that Extinction Rebellion are going to rear their ugly Absolutely. head again. So it will be, of course, those things that cleverly mentioned are not yet on the statute mm -hmm. book. And the Met have got themselves in a dreadful tangle interpreting obstruction of the highway, for example, mm -hmm. originally doing nothing, serving people pizzas and bottles of water <laughs> and all that utterly unforgivable nonsense before actually waking up to the arguments that myself and other police and crime commentators have been putting forward, that this legislation is applicable mm -hmm. and you can use it. And lo and behold, a few weeks later, after huge media pressure and pressure from the public, they actually started doing exactly what we've been mm -hmm. calling on them to do for weeks. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a more robust attitude from the police, but please don't hold your breath, viewers and listeners. <laughs> Because, of course, senior policing has been completely hijacked in the last quarter of a century or so by the liberal, fluffy, wokerati, university-educated senior cops, many of whom have gone to Oxbridge, that's Oxford or Cambridge units for people like me, I, I just picked up on that word the <laughs> other day, um, or other famous universities, seats of learning, and have come back to policing with their heads full of pseudo-intellectual claptrap, which has no place in policing, which fails the front line because it is weak. It gets mm -hmm. blown by the wind. And, in fact, you've got so many senior police le leaders now who have very little experience of the front line, which mm. they found all a little bit too grubby for them anyway, right? And they did, mm -hmm. hence they got up that greasy polar promotion as soon as they possibly could. Um, so they have very little experience of it, but... If you want them to write a 10,000-word dissertation on reflective practice, then mm -hmm. they'd be your people. Reflective practice? Oh, yes. Oh, gosh, that sounds like that's going to solve everything for us. Oh, it's a real Oxbridge obsession, and they <laughs> love it. And now in even new police officers coming into policing and going through that completely unnecessary nonsense of having to study for a degree whilst they're also to be expected to be out on the streets mm. policing... They actually now are given scenarios that say, for example, they arrest someone, they are then asked to not go out on the streets and nick another one, but to sit down and write a 4,000-word essay on how one reflects upon mm -hmm. that arrest and procedure. What? utter nonsense <laughs> no wonder we're all going to hell in a handcart i mean there'll be people watching and listening at home who saw you know uh, uh, protesters gluing themselves to roads in other countries and literally being kind of ripped off the road with absolutely no mercy deliberately because you know they were breaking the law they were blocking highways and wondering why on earth we don't do that here yeah and of course we've seen over here <clears throat> that members of the public have taken to removing yes. them from the highways and yet they're the ones being prosecuted <clears throat> well there, there was indeed a woman who kind of nudged a woman gently along the road in a very large car, behaviour that I would not condone mm. or recommend in any way, shape or form. But, yeah, these people are finding themselves getting into trouble, largely due to police inaction. Mm -hmm. And that cannot be right. There is a perception now, and many, many people argue about this and speak about it some very cogently, <clears throat> and the expression is two-tier policing. Mm -hmm. 
they see one group of protesters, say, for example, uh, protesters that might be followers of the uh, largely lamentable Tommy Robinson, mm. a man that I'm not a fan of, but has an audience and has a lot of support, mm -hmm. they might see followers of him being treated in a very different way by the police than we've seen the pro-Palestinian demonstrators in recent weeks. And when people see that, that brings this two-tier policing expression mm -hmm. to the forefront and it's quite understandable why people are thinking that way. They see what, what they will clumsily call far-right demonstrators being kettled, corralled, officers standing there ready to give them a whack with a baton and all of that. Mm -hmm. And then they will see pro-Palestinian protesters chanting insidious words, mm -hmm. waving black flags and, and, and other kind of things, which people are convinced are illegal and the police do nothing. They're, they're, they seem to facilitate mm -hmm. that kind of process. And it is through this uneven-handedness that discontent grows. Mm -hmm. And with a police that are obsessed about diversity, equality, inclusion, and all those kind of things, mm -hmm. who then appear to police in a contradictory kind of way, is it any wonder that this country is slowly but surely becoming a tinderbox? So we've diagnosed the problem, but what is the solution? Even-handed, firm policing. Mm -hmm. Policing without fear or favour, mm -hmm. an expression that I'm sure viewers and listeners will have heard many times and used to be an absolute cornerstone mm -hmm. of policing before reflective practice took mm -hmm. over. Police without fear or favour. Keep the streets safe, prevent and detect crime, and lo and behold, it would be possible, would I say, repeat, would be possible that people might start to respect the police mm. again. But the police themselves are now obsessed with this trust and confidence. Again, you know, an expression that was thought up doubtless in some common room at a university, if they have such things, you can tell I've never <laughs> been, right? Whatever it may be. Yeah, whereas actually what the police should be concerning themselves with is regaining some respect from people. Mm -hmm. But they're a very, very long way away from yeah. that happening because they don't investigate the crimes that happen to us all. Burglary, car theft. Mm -hmm. I live in the Metropolitan Police car theft hotspot, by right. the way. So don't have a nice car if you live down my manor because you won't find it on the driveway in the mm -hmm. morning. Burglary, car crime, uh nicking people's phones, mm. their bicycles. I know se sexual offences as well at the moment are so tricky. Because and the streets are not a hostile environment for criminals anymore. Yeah. The police have surrendered the streets because they're too busy, as they would argue, with some justification, going from one call to another call mm. to another call to another call. Mm -hmm. But they turned themselves into a social service and not a police service. It wasn't what the public wanted. Mm -hmm. They did that. Their leadership did that. And there are so many cops that actually want to be nicking people. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a, that's a, why have a warrant card if you're not going to use it? Why have powers of arrest if you're not going to use mm -hmm. them? You know, that's the joy of being a police officer. Actually saying to someone, you know, you're under arrest. Mm -hmm. That's the joy. Gathering the evidence, getting them in front of a court, seeing them convicted. Not sitting behind a desk, but the Met's got over 800 officers that it can't have doing their work because they're either suspended or mm. debarred from doing public-facing duties because of misconduct allegations mm -hmm. and investigations. The Met Police is a complete basket case, and I could be here all afternoon quoting examples about where it is failing the public. And that kind of... That, that malaise has seeped into other police services the length and breadth of the country, sadly. We often hear, and we, indeed we heard it earlier from uh, Anthony Glees from the Centre for Security at Buckingham University, that, frankly, we need more police. I mean, do you, do you agree with that, or do you think the problems are, are much more fundamental? Yeah, I, I would certainly like more mm. police officers, but I don't want more flaky, fluffy, macarena-dancing police officers. I want less of those. Mm -hmm. I want police officers keeping the streets safe, enforcing the law, arresting people the wrongdoers, earning respect from the public. It's no point getting more and more police officers if they're only going to join a social service and not a police service. Mm -hmm. What we really need 
is a complete change of police leadership because so many police leaders these days are about self-service and not public service. They all want to get up that greasy pole of promotion. And to do that, they have to learn this language, which is a language all of senior police's own making. And if you don't toe the line, if you're a voice that stands up and says, this is wrong, to a senior officer, mm -hmm. we have to change this, we have to challenge that, then I can pretty much guarantee your promotion prospects are going to disappear with the wind, you'll be marooned at the level you're at forever and a day. Mm -hmm. And that's what is so, so wrong. And again, ever since the intellectuals took over policing, it has tanked. Policing is an industry, and I'm talking about the National Police Chiefs Council, mm -hmm. the College of Policing, a complete waste of time, a quango, a club, an utter abject centre of nonsense which just seeps out to all the other police leadership. And there is an industry around policing, of magazines, a policing TV channel, of think tanks. It's huge. Mm. It's vast. It's an industry, not just the police officers, but the policing industry around it. And they are all chock-a-block full of intellectuals with more letters after their names than you can imagine. And ever since that lot got older policing, it's gone through the floor. What I will say mm -hmm. is policing was not perfect in my day. Of course it wasn't. There were certain detectives who handled more brown envelopes than the post office, and there were certain people that got arrested who it was said had a trouble going up or down flights of stairs. I get all of that, and that was abominable, and that was mm -hmm. wrong. Policing will never be perfect, mm -hmm. but it could and it should be so much better than what it is today. Mm -hmm.